Two Hats family, welcome back to episode four of the Two Hats podcast. I know we're up to four. Isn't that, isn't that amazing, Brittany? That is insane. I can't believe it's already been four episodes. Um, and I, I swear to just keep getting better and better. Um, we have a really good episode for you today. Um, our Today's topic is about absconding. All right. So just before we get into that, I'm Chris, uh, the tactical probation officer. And, and I'm Brittany, your favorite host. PO. Yes. And uh, we're episode four. That is amazing. We are, we're, we're doing this thing. Um, but today's episode is about absconding. Um, so absconding is the act of willfully avoiding supervision. Um, so the re- reason they put the word willful is because, you know, if you end up in the hospital, you can't report to your probation officer. That's not willful. That's not your fault. But willful means you're actively avoiding. You're not living where you're telling your officer you're living. You're not coming to your appointments. Um, the officer can't get a hold of you by the phone. They come to the house. You know, people at the house are saying you don't live there anymore. Or they haven't seen you. At that point, you're absconding. So it's, you know, absconding, it happens. It's a regular part of probation. Um, something we don't, we, don't, we don't want to deal with. Um, we would like all of our offenders to be in compliance, to do what they have to do. Um, to make it through probation. But of course, you know, when you're dealing with people that are committing crimes and don't want to change their behaviors, then you do get into absconding. So Brittany, tell me a little bit about your experience. Have you have you ever had to abscond somebody? You know, like you said, there's always some people that don't want to do right and they don't want to show up. So in that event, you know, we have steps we take when people stop reporting. First step would be obviously call them uh, if they miss their first report, reschedule them, send out a, an appointment letter to their residents, um, call their all their contacts, um, you know, all the relatives that they have listed um, in their paperwork. And then if none of that works, you know, we do the home visit, we go into the field, we see, you know, are they living at this address that they gave us? And if there's still no contact at that point, then, you know, you're considered an absconder, so to speak. Uh, once that happens we do contact the courts we get the warrant um and once that happened in our department then the case will be, be transferred to our absconder unit which comprised of um one probation officer and then there were two uh deputy sheriffs so they would then go out and look for the actively look for the offender at that point well i'll tell you the uh, big difference such a big difference between being a um juvenile officer and adult officer working with absconders because in juvenile you're thinking you know you're dealing with this you know 14 15 16 year old kid and you would think man how could how can a 14 15 year old 16 year old kid be an absconder you would be surprised these kids will disappear on you it boggles the mind i'm talking about you, know, you get to the house and the, you know, the parents are like i don't know he just up and left one day and i don't know where he is and I couldn't imagine that growing up. I could never imagine not knowing my kid, not know, not my parents not knowing where I was. I couldn't imagine right now as a, as a parent not knowing where my kids were. But it was just, it was so common. It was scary. Do you find that it's the same as far as like with boys and girls as on juvenile? I feel like the boys they're more inclined to just leave the house and mom and dad don't know where this kid is versus a girl. I don't know. You tell me. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's definitely more the boys than the girls. Um, yeah, definitely, more, definitely. Um, and I have some man, I got some crazy stories. And actually, if you listen to at your uh, your favorite PO's channel, where she where she's on some interviews with me um, before we started this podcast, I got some pretty good stories in there too. So definitely make sure you check out her chat, her YouTube channel. Yeah, um, it will be linked in the, in the description box, so you guys check it out. Exactly. Um, but it's it's amazing. It's amazing. A 15 year old kid could just not live at home. And you'd be surprised half the time is the parents are hiding the kid out. They send them to another family member's house, uh, which I could never understand. Your kid is in trouble. And your answer to them being in trouble is to get them in more trouble and to hide them out. Or you'll have kids go to their friend's house. And their friend's family just OK with them staying there for days, weeks at a time boggles the mind because I know growing up I could never do that my friend could never just come over my house and stay there for weeks and I just not know where they are so it's different um in addition here is ad- working with adults it's so much easier they will disappear um <laughs> the second they think they're in trouble you know because they're testing dirty or they picked up some new charges most of the time they picked up new charges and they know that there's a violation coming 
So they'll, they'll disappear on you. Um, that's pretty common. And, you know, with adults, you know, they have more contacts, more relations. Um, it's easier for them to go. You know, you have a guy, he might have five or six girlfriends. And he'll just bounce around <laughs> between the houses. No, it's a true story. The true story. I definitely had a guy and I was at his house one day and his phone rang and he, you know, on the screen is a number. It's the number six. I'm like, I was like, you want to take that? Oh man, that's, that's, that's girlfriend number six. I'm like, you don't have their names in your phone. You just called them by a number. I'm telling you. I'm like, oh, how many you got? He's like, I'm at up to nine. I'm like, wow, dude. Hey, live your life, dude. Live your life. But that sounds like a big con artist. Nine exactly. Um, hey, he's a Rolling Stone where he lays his hats his home, I guess. Um, I wonder what he was on probation for. Hmm. Drugs. Drugs, mm, okay. <laughs> drugs, drug selling, drug selling. Mm, okay, yeah. makes sense. Um, but most of the time, you'll be surprised. They eventually go back home, especially if they're living with mama. It's either mama or baby mama. Those are usually the two places you're gonna find them. Um, and what I personally like to do is when I when I first work get a case, I uh, I definitely introduce myself to the family. I um try to present myself as I'm I'm here to help you get your loved one out of trouble and back back to back to back to doing what they have to do. And I try to build my relationship not only trying to build a professional relationship not only with the offender but with their family. Sometimes right. what I'll do too is you know if I go to a offender's house and I actually carry this over from when I when I was working juvenile is um you know when I if I, they introduce me to their mom or their mom answers the door like oh yeah I'm such and such's mom I'll be like you know the next time I'll go by I'm like hey mom how are you doing? You build that relationship with them. You're getting real comfortable so that when that offender does take off or they do something wrong, they're more inclined to help you because they know that you're kind of on their side. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, you'll always, have, you'll, you'll always have those uh, those those parents that are just, no matter what, I'm not going to not gonna do anything to get my kid in trouble and I won't tell you where they are. But you build that relationship over time, you know, you'll, you'll get to that point. I always so, thought it was funny that when they when the offender did get arrested after being abscond after being an absconder, then I would hear from the mom, uh, oh my son is in jail. What happened? What can I do? But I've been calling you for two months and you haven't been answering my call. <laughs> oh, now you want to blow my phone up. I've been trying to reach you. <laughs> uh calling up talking about how much is the bond. Yeah. <laughs> I always thought that was funny. Then you get that computer alert that they've been bonded out. Mama came and got them. Mama came and got them. Yep. <laughs> but like I said, we have a great episode. We have a great interview today with uh, Matt. He's an officer out of Ohio. So uh, Two Hats family, stay tuned and listen to the interview. <laughs> All right, Matt. So the first question, the first two questions are uh, standard questions we ask everyone. All right. So on the Two Hats scale, of one to ten, with one being a social worker and ten being a cop, how does your department fall on the two hat scale? So on that scale, my department probably is a six towards law enforcement, right? Because one is a social work. Yes. So probably a six. We're we're fairly in the middle, but uh, I would say that. We, we believe in accountability in our department. So taking people back to court and uh, sanctioning people is a little bit more, is a little bit easier for us than from what I've heard from some other departments. So I would say probably a six. That's, that's, a, that's good. That's a good balance. That's definitely a good balance. I think, uh, I think Aaron said he was about, they were about, I think Aaron said they were at a five. So six is pretty good. That's a pretty good mix. So you're on a six, yeah, six towards the law enforcement side. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, they do. We do a lot of training in Ohio to try to make that as even as possible. I think sometimes they try to slide us over over the other way, but we fight to keep it in the middle at least. Yeah, you got to you got to do that. Um, you have to know there is accountability for it. OK, man, I have a question for you. So what made you decide to get into probation? So. I had just graduated from college. My degree is in nothing social work or criminal justice related at all. And I was working my student job <clears throat> and I got laid off. 
they had asked me to stay on for a little while after I graduated. I was planning on going to, to graduate school and I, you know, was just kind of motoring along. And then they one day were like, our department's not going to make budget. We need to lay off the lowest person on the totem pole. And that's you. So that was, I mean, I was 22. So to say that was the first time, first time in my life I was ever, un, ever unemployed. It's probably whatever. I was 22, but it was scary as hell for me to be unemployed right out of college. So I started working for a, a halfway house in the city I live in. And that was my first introduction to any type of community corrections uh, environment whatsoever. I would say up until then, the total amount of law enforcement community corrections experience that I had was just the, just watching cops, basically. <laughs> I, had, I had no clue what I was getting into. So I did that for eight years and I went from working the front desk to being a case manager to a shift supervisor to working in the training department. And then finally I was a quality assurance manager. And then I applied for the department that I work for now and didn't get it. And the job that I currently have, which is the mental health court uh, probation officer came available and they reached out to me and asked me to interview for it. And so I interviewed for it, for it. That's a pretty funny story actually too, because the person that is my docket coordinator was had her heart set on somebody else. She had told them, we don't even need to do any more interviews. I know who I want. And the chief said, you're going to want to talk to this guy. He, he's going to be the guy that you want. And she was like, you don't even need to bring him in. I don't want to talk to him. I came in and by the end of the interview, they offered me the job. So, so That's I've been impressive. For, what'd you say? That's impressive. Yeah. I mean, I was pretty well prepared and I've been working with people that have had mental health issues or, you know, just trying to, just trying to get back on their feet for a long time. So thought I was pretty well prepared. And then, uh, and then I've been doing the mental health court and doing absconder stuff now for the last six years. So, so it's been, it's been a fun ride. That's Do crazy. Most... Go ahead. Go ahead, Brit. Brit. No, go ahead, Britt. I just thought, I wanted to know, do you see yourself retiring from this uh, line of work? Absolutely. I, I true. And I'm not trying to build it up for those out there that are, you know, trying to decide if they want to do this or not. This job is definitely a calling. You have to want to do it. This isn't a job where you can come into it and say, I'm going to do this for a couple of years until something else comes along. You get weeded out way faster if you don't like it. And if you like it, you're in it forever. I have no desire to leave and do something else right now. I get my little bit of law enforcement. I get my little bit of social work. You know, I, there's, I work in an office. I don't have to just sit in a car all day. You know, it's, it's a great situation to be in for somebody that's looking for a little bit of everything. And I like to do something different every day. And I, I've been doing this job for six years and that's six years of every day, something different. So that's really helped out. That is definitely a great part of the job. And I definitely agree with everything you said, because that's exactly how I feel. Um, so my question for you then is you never came in as like a line officer, which most, most departments you come in as a line officer kind of handling, you know, basic cases. Um, but you came in a, into a specialty position. Do you feel that was an advantage or disadvantage? Because I'm in a specialty position now doing drug court, but I always started as a regular line officer taking basic cases. So I'm definitely interested in how does it take, how does it feel just jumping right into a specialty position? So that's a great question because recently in our department, we jump, we shuffled cases and I now have 80 low level supervision cases in addition to my mental health cases. So I feel like jumping into mental health expertly prepared me to supervise these low level cases because I, I feel like I don't have to do anything. It's like they're running, they're running themselves because I'm so prepared to do these intensive mental health supervisions that I don't have. It's not, it's like 2% of the work. I feel like not saying that there aren't defenders that are low level that aren't problems, but you know, I feel like, yeah, that uh, I was, I was really scared when I first started, 
and you can ask my wife, I really, really had to think about it because I knew it was a specialty docket. I knew that it was going to require a lot more supervision than a regular probation case would. would. And I just didn't know if I was prepared. I had, I had never worked specifically in mental health. My, my interactions with people with mental health problems were exclusive to the halfway house, which were people that were in outpatient programs. And so I really took that decision seriously. And honestly, it was the best decision I ever made. I would say it took me about a year to get acclimated to everything, but that's the only type of supervision I've ever known. So I feel like I can transition into any type of supervision now, whether it be uh, low level or intensive or another specialty docket. I have, I have the ability to do that because I have such a broad, a broad knowledge base right now. Yeah, I'll give it to you, man. There's, there's three types of caseloads I couldn't do. Mental health, sex offender, and domestic violence. I just couldn't do it. I, I just, my personality um, you know, but just how I was raised. I just, those three, three dockets I couldn't do. So I definitely, uh, hats off to you. I know there's a lot of people that say, man, I can never do it a drug case, caseload and doing all those, you know, drug addicted people. But you know, that's, that's my passion. Those are the kind of people I like to work with. So I definitely understand that, you know, once you find your niche, um, it's hard to, uh, try to give that up. So I definitely understand. Well, that's, that's the beauty of, of this line of work is that, there are so many different types of supervisions that you can, you can find your niche with, you know, like you said, just in specialty dockets in our County, we have a veterans court, a mental health court and a drug court. And then other counties in Ohio have uh, reentry courts, which only take judicial release. Some specialty courts only do, uh, only do uh, pre-conviction, in Ohio, that's known as intervention in lieu of conviction. We mix those up in our department. And then, you know, there's, you can either do intensive or moderate or low level supervision, or you can do juveniles if you want to. I would see, and that's, I would never do juveniles. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit later when we talk about some of the absconder stuff. I've worked some juvenile cases with absconders, and those were by far the worst people I have ever encountered in my life for those juveniles. It was so hard to just meet them at their level. You know, I think I do a really good job of that with people with mental health issues is I work really hard to understand where they're coming from and understand that maybe they've never had the, you know, the person in their life that has been willing to hear them for who they are. And I think that goes for people on drug court dockets as well, that supervise drug court dockets. You really need to understand where they're coming from to be able to, to meet them and to bring them up to the level that they're capable of, because that's what it's really about. That's what I tell my, my offenders is that it's not about what my expectation is of you. It's about what your expectation of yourself is and that you can become the best person that you can be. It has nothing to do with what the judge tells you to do or what I tell you to do, because we're not driving your car. I always tell my offenders that I'm the guardrails. You're, you got your foot on the gas. You're the one that's moving the car. I'm just making sure you don't go flying off the road. So yeah, it's all about, uh, it's all about what we can do where we can fit in. Wow. That's great. Um, so tell us more about uh, the subsconder unit. You said you, did you say you started it or are you just a part of it? Or both? Well, so <clears throat> my department is very small, especially in terms of just, you know, some like your agency is a state agency. In Ohio, there's the state agency, the Adult Parole Authority, but they don't do any probation supervisions anymore. They only do uh, post-release control, parole supervisions. So 88 counties in Ohio, 88 departments, uh, you know, Franklin County, which supervises Columbus, Ohio, you know, they have like two floors at the courthouse of officers. We have, I, I actually looked last night, we have 13 POs. When I first started, we had seven. So it's doubled in size since I started six years ago. Uh, most of our active warrants are sent to the, uh, to the sheriff's office, and then they either send them to the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force or they work them. 
And in February of 2017, I think, me and another guy ran a report, saw how many active warrants we had, went to our chief and said, hey, how do you feel about us clearing some of these warrants? We feel like we can track them down and probably probably get them into jail, get them back to court. We can get this done. And our boss apparently had just had a meeting with the judges who referenced this report and said, we would like to see these absconder numbers go down. So he basically turned us loose and said, you know, within your 40 hours, make sure that you can, you know, you can clear some of these warrants. So we started with five and we cleared them within two weeks and just went from there. And now we're on the fugitive task force as well. So, uh, so we help out with our violent offenders too. You know, it's, uh, that's the part of my job. I love both parts of my job. I love the, the mental health docket part, but this is like my woo stuff because my, my degree is in history. So I have always been used to doing research and finding people is just like doing research. And that's what I love to go to find bad guys. So, you know, that's, that's kind of how our absconder unit started, quote unquote. You know, it's just two of us that kind of donate some of our time to try to track some of our open warrants down. That's funny, because actually when I was a juvenile officer in PA, and PA is set up the same way as Ohio, where you have the adult parole and then the probations at the county level. And we had six or seven counties doing things six or seven different kind of ways. Um, so I definitely understand where that system is. And I, I, I actually do like the state run system that I am in now. But I actually did try to start a uh, warrant unit uh, for my county for our juvenile offenders for the same reason our our uh, absconder docket was pretty high. And um, I had, I had uh, actually facilitated one warrant sweep we had done. Um, where we partnered up with the sheriff's office and we went out and we actually for one day and we actually you know probably arrested about five juveniles surprisingly um and then just trying to get it formally started and i tried to set up another one and at that po- at that particular moment in time where i was trying to do all that the department was leaning more towards the social work side heavy our chief that's what she wanted to do that's where she wanted to move things and she just put a whole kibosh to it. She's like, nope, let the sheriffs handle it. If they come across them, they come across them. Um, the issue is that the sheriff's office, you know, their juvenile warrants at the bottom of their list because you know, they're dealing with adult warrants, you know. Um, so it was, I mean, if you if you call them up and say, hey, you know, we're looking to go do something, they'll be willing to do it. But just them on their own, you know, getting taking the initiative to go clear juvenile warrants, they're, they're not going to do it. It's bottom of their list, so. Yeah, you're so pretty, you're uh, pretty lucky with that one. So, I, I, yeah, everything you just said, speaking straight to my heart, honestly, uh, it's just, it's just crazy how stuff kind of. When, when you were talking about swinging to the social work side, so my opinion is that cleaning cleaning warrants up, so picking warrants up, is an integral part of that social work side, because while yes, it's like going and arresting somebody and putting them in handcuffs and taking them to the jail, but you're holding them accountable for their actions. And if you don't do that, how is somebody going to learn how to not repeat a behavior? You know, I, I've had people that I have arrested four or five times on failure to appear warrants and then probation violation warrants. And I will go out and get them a hundred times if I have to. Because eventually they're going to understand that this behavior is not advancing them in any way whatsoever. And they're going to need to actually commit and be serious about either their recovery or just being a citizen. And that's why I think the warrant stuff fits into the social work side. I know that that's not an opinion that a lot of people share, especially people in management, because they see people with guns and handcuffs and bulletproof vests as the ultimate law enforcement side. But we need to hold our offenders accountable because if we don't, they're never going to learn. You know, something in Ohio that we're really big on now is uh, it's like they're called cob hours, changing offender behavior hours. That's a training we have to do. It's all the CBT stuff, the kind of behavioral therapy stuff. All the evidence evidence based stuff. Right. Exactly. And all of that is about making sure that 
we as POs understand where our offenders are coming from and being able to help them. Well, if they're out on the streets using or running around, we can't help them at all. We need to know where they're at. And part of that is if they have a warrant, making sure that they get into the jail, get into a program, do something so that they can get help. And, you know, so when we just leave our warrants go, you don't know what that person's doing. That, that's truly scary to me is, and it's not about the violent offenders. It's about, for me, the, the people with mental health issues and drug problems that we could try to get them and get them help, but we're just leaving them out there. So, you know, that's, that's a big reason that I, I'm dedicated to the warrant stuff. Preach. Brandon, do you have a question? No, not right now. I'm trying to think. Of I'm still trying to wake up. I mean, I've been on my soapbox too. Let me just step off of that real quick. No, no, Matt, you're you're doing wonderful. Um, this is your this is your time to shine and to share so that people can really understand. Um, you know how things are done in your jurisdiction because, like I said, we want people to, from different parts of the country to see how things are done in different places. All right, so. Matt, tell me about what is the how what's the process you guys go through in order to get a warrant issued for um for an absconder. So so they stopped reporting, you don't know where they're going to their house, they're not they're not there. Um you can't you can't get a hold of them. They're now absconder. What's your process? So so that's gonna be the first thing is they have to establish a pattern of non-reporting or non-compliance in some way. So just like you said, you know, they have to either not report for appointments. Uh, I'll tell you what my process is for issuing a warrant. It's if a, if it varies just slightly officer to officer, that's why I say my process. Uh, a person fails to report for a, an office visit. I'm going to call them either later that day or the next day and reschedule them, leave them a voicemail saying, Hey, you missed your office appointment. You need to be here on Tuesday at three. So let's say they don't show up to that appointment. I will send them a report letter then for them to report on another day, probably a week later, saying, you missed your appointment. This is your new report day and time. And if they miss that, then I will issue a warrant. And it's a, an email to the prosecutor's office in our county that, uh, that details all of the violations of their conditions of supervision. And then it takes about three to four days for that to work its way from the prosecutor's office to the court and then for the judge to sign the warrant and then for the warrant to get entered in NCIC. So yeah, we gotta, uh, gotta that, build that violation, build the violation, say, Hey, listen, this date, this date, this date, these are the attempts I've made. Yeah. You got to build it. Cause that's what the DAs want to see when they go to court. Cause when that uh, scotter does get picked up, um, you know, and, you know, they try to challenge it, say, oh, I didn't abscond. Well, you could say, hey, listen, on this date, this date, this date, you didn't do what you're supposed to do. So is going to their residence uh, to try to make contact with them a part of your uh, violation process? It is normally. Right now, it's a little bit different because of the just the current situation of things in, in the world. But uh, that would also be a part of, of the process. For me, sometime during that period between their initial missed appointment to the time when their uh, their date for their report in the report letter would be, I would attempt a home contact. Right now, I'm, I'm accomplishing that about 80% of the time, but uh, but just with the way things are with COVID, sometimes it's I got to try to get them to report by phone or text message or something just to hear from them, and if I don't hear from them, then. They will know specifically, though, that a warrant will be issued for them. It's not just just like you said, you got to build that uh, that case. And in the last episode, I was hearing you talk to Aaron about about this as well. Nothing that I do is going to be unknown to my offender. They're going to know everything. It, yes. You know, uh, nothing that happens to them is going to be something that I hadn't specifically talked to them about, including getting their warrant. I'm not just going to just going to surprise somebody with a warrant. That is that is the absolute last thing I want to do to somebody, because I'm going to be taking your freedom away when you're picked up on that warrant. That is something I take very seriously. So you have to be able to articulate why you eventually got there. And that's why it's important to build that case. And then just like you said, it's also awesome when the D.A. looks at the uh, 
looks at the violation and is like, oh man, this is open and shut. And I've also had judges who, when the people go to uh, deny their violation, you know, they'll be, they'll go to sentencing after the violation is over and they're found guilty. And the, the judge will just go through, well, on this date, Matt tried to call you. Is that right or wrong? Did you get that voicemail? On this date, Matt, to try, Matt tried to show up at your house and you left a card telling you to report. On this date, Matt sent you a letter. Did you get none of these things? And then it forces the offender to tell the judge why they were non-compliant. So, you know, I think that's, that's that feels really good for me as a PO when a, uh, when a, when it, they basically walk themselves into admitting their violation. So, it's, it's nice. Yeah, exactly. Because um, I know one of the things we do uh, back in juvenile and actually here in adult is when we go over the conditions of probation, we let them know up front that, hey, this is what's considered absconding. If you're not coming to me when you're not reporting to me as you're instructed, I can't get a hold of you and you're not living where you tell me you're living, that's absconding and you'll get a warrant. So you gotta build that uh you gotta build that bridge at the very beginning to let them know that this is what can possibly happen to you. But you always still get those people like, oh, I didn't know, or I didn't understand, or no, I really wasn't absconding. You just, you know, you just, I just, you know, whenever you came, I was just never there. Or I was at work every time you came. They always have every excuse in the book. But it's been six months and you haven't seen your PO. <laughs> what you, been there. I, I've heard that. It's been six months and you haven't seen your PO. Did you forget your own probation? The one that absolutely cracks me up is when they say that they didn't know that they were an absconder. So in our jurisdiction, when they go for sentencing off their case, the judge reads them all of their community control sanctions, every single one. And one of them specifically details that you are to report to probation when you are instructed at the time you are instructed. And then when they come into our office, we have them sign, we have them initial next to all of their terms as basically saying, you know, the judge Sorry, my dog is right behind me. Uh, basically <laughs> well, saying down. that, fire. basically saying, yeah, you understand all these conditions of community control. You're signing off on them. We have so many layers where everything is so clear that when they're like, and I also love when they say stuff like, oh, I was going to call you next week. Uh, of course you were. Everybody's about to call me next week. You know, yeah, it just I've cracks had that. me up. Don't call me next week. Call me today. Then all we wouldn't them, have to be here. All of them always think that they're the first person to come up with their excuse as well. Like, I like to think about, like, in their head when they're like, I'm going to tell Matt this. I'm going to be the first person to ever tell Matt this excuse, and I'm going to sell it so well. And then I say, you are the 100th person to use this excuse on me. You know, <laughs> you are not... You are not the first person to be on probation. There have been thousands before you. Everything's been done. It's like baking bread. It's down to a science. Yep. Right. Right. It's funny because uh, part of um, cognitive behavioral therapy is what are called uh, uh, criminal thinking patterns. And one of the things that one of the uh, criminal thinking patterns is unique person stands thinking. What that means is that you think that you are special, that you are unique and that there's nobody else like you, nobody has ever thought anything like you. And that kind of goes exactly like what you're saying, Matt. They think in their mind, they're the first person to come up with that excuse and that excuse is gonna work because they're special and they're unique. Um, a lot of drug addicts use that too. Um, but that's, a, that's very interesting that you use that one. Um, I'm all about so, the thinking errors, man. All about thinking the thinking errors, errors. yes. Um, so let's uh, let's go back to all right. So you have a you have a warrant issued for somebody for absconding, or you get one from one of your coworkers, and since you're part of this team, um, go ahead and walk, walk us a little bit through your process. How do you go out? How do you go out and find this person? So first thing I'm going to do is look through our database and look at the last several notes that the officer put in there. I'm also going to talk to the officer. You know, I'll usually look through the notes first and then go talk to the officer and say. Hey, I was just looking at John Smith and I see he last reported a new address to you on, on October 1st. 
Have you been out there? I'm just wondering what your feel for that is, if you think that's a good address or if you think that address is a bad address that they were just telling you something. Uh, and I'll start there. I, I try to work from their most recent address back and it's kind of like a web. So I'll start at that most recent address and see who they reported as living there and go from there as well. I'll also do a, uh, I'll run a, a, a report on them through our law enforcement database that uh, on that address specifically and see who else lives there. And then I'll run, run their name through a couple of different databases to see if I'm getting other, any other hits on any other addresses. For me, my process starts with the addresses. I try to narrow down the addresses as quickly as possible because some of our offenders are so transient, especially when they have a warrant, you could be yes. two days behind them at some point. So I try to do that. A resource for people that are just starting out doing this, that's public record in Ohio at least, is that I use all the time, are court records. So municipal court records specifically, you know, people that have traffic tickets, people that have gotten minor possession charges, things like that, all of that is public record in Ohio. And if you go to like, like Franklin County Municipal Court, it will have the address of every uh, address that they reported during every contact that they've had with the court. So, you know, I'll go back and look for any commonalities with addresses because I might not be able to find where that person is today, but if I can find an address that they've been using for years, it's probably a family member's address. And maybe that person wants them off the street just as much as I do for their own safety. And so I'll start there. I try to I try to find the addresses. That's the key thing. Uh, also, just something I try to do initially too is use VineLink. If you're familiar with VineLink, uh, which is yep. will tell you if somebody's in custody or not. Because I can't tell you how many times I've been like, "Oh yeah, this person is going to be at one two three Smith Street," and I'm getting ready to go out there, and then I look them in Vine and they're in custody somewhere. You know, because that happens a lot too. Because you know, either our offenders aren't truthful or they get new charges and they, or they just get arrested on stuff and they're all over the place. You know, it's like uh, trying to nail jello to a wall sometimes, but my oh, main, true. but my main uh, thing is trying to narrow down their maybe most recent three addresses or their three most common addresses. So, like I said, I start out with our database, all of our offenders in my court get a pre-sentence investigation done. So that's going to have all of their family members, all of their their spouses and children's like their children's mothers or children's fathers and i can start there and then i start into social media and i look through their social media uh i feel like social media is a way better option or path for juvenile offenders yes uh, they tend to put way more out on social media uh adult offenders it's just good to know who they hang out with so then you know you look at their facebook friends and you, I mean, so I've been doing this now for two years, Upsconder specifically, and I can look through somebody's Facebook friends and tell you, and I can tell if they're on probation or not with our county. And then I can have them get scheduled for an appointment and then interview them when they come in for their appointment. So it's just about trying to find as many avenues to that person as you can and not get stuck in one specific way. You have to be pretty flexible. Yeah, I remember, uh, you know, working back in juvenile, one thing I could never understand was how a 15-year-old kid can go on the run. Like, I can imagine when I was 15, not living at home with my parents, you know what I mean? But these juveniles, they'll just disappear. And they don't necessarily disappear, because sometimes, most of the time, the parents know where they are. They send them to another family member's house, or, you know, they're staying at their friend's house, which... Growing up, back in my days, I couldn't imagine my best friend coming over and staying in my house for days and weeks at a time, and my mom just being okay with it, you know, but it happened all the time back in juvenile. I could just never understand how juveniles can go on the run, but one thing is they always return home, because what they'll do is they'll, they'll disappear for maybe a month or two, and then they think you forgot about them, and then they go back home and act like everything is still, you know, everything is, you know, good now, and then you pop back, then you pop up and go. Um, they usually, they always go back. They think after a month or two that you just forgot about them. That warrant doesn't go away. It's still there. 
Yeah, and I will shout out juvenile POs all day long. Like I said before, uh, I will, I've been working a couple of uh, juvenile warrants with our fugitive task force. And, you know, these kids are reported missing in addition to whatever juvenile warrants they have. So you, you start to work them up and you think, oh, this is a missing kid. Because in my mind, when I hear missing kid, I think endangered child, not, mm -hmm. not like violent criminal who is under the age of 18 where their whereabouts are just unknown. Because in my world, that's just an absconder. That's not a, a missing person. But uh, like I worked one this week where it was a missing kid, but they had, I think, an aggravated burglary and a carrying concealed weapon worn out through, through, the, through the juvenile court. And when we found them, they had a gun on them. You know, that's that you just have to have this whole other mindset when you go work those because they're not missing kids. It's just crazy. I agree with you on that one. They're, they're not, um, you know, like I said, most of the time the parents know where they are. They just don't want to tell you. Oh, this uh, kid was at home. Know. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> just um, like you said. So actually I had actually, I actually worked a couple of uh, uh, juvenile absconders back in my day where the local departments, what they started doing was if we found a juvenile at, you know, say their friend's house or their friend's parent's house or a, a relative's house, um, what, the, what they actually started doing was charging the, uh, the adults in the house with uh, interfering with the custody of a minor because um, they're not supposed to live there. They're supposed to be home with their parents. So they were charged, they were charged the adult with that. And that actually did let, uh, lead to some people having second thoughts about letting these uh, juveniles in their homes. Um, but it didn't stop them, these kids from going on the rundown, you know. Uh, it would be, you know, they'll test positive on a drug test. They, you know, they go automatically to I'm in trouble. I'm going to get locked up and they take off. They don't they don't ever think anything through um, or, hey, I got a new charge, um, you know, before that charge gets to my PO. Let me go ahead and take off, you know. Um, hey, the adults do that, too, though. They do. But it's just different <laughs> when it's a, it's a juvenile because you're like, it's a kid. You're supposed to be a kid. You're supposed to be home with your parents not run the streets, you know? Um, so, all right, so Matt, so tell us, uh, do you have any uh, crazy uh, absconding stories or, you know, arresting someone? Um, any interesting stories you want to share? Absolutely. I, I Last night, I took a couple of minutes and just wrote a couple of notes down because I wanted to make sure I hit my greatest hits for you guys. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I think the first one I'll tell you is it's a whole, it's, it's funny because it shows how, how small the offender community is sometimes and why it's really important that we as POs know our caseload and just kind of know the, uh, the other offenders that are supervised in our office. So we had a, uh, a failure to appear warrant on a, on a gentleman. I'll just call him John Smith. And we, we had an address on him and I'm looking at this address and I, I was just like, I know this address. I, I, can't, I cannot picture it, but I know it. And so me and the team went to go work it, and we were going to the address, and we're pulling up to it. And I look at it, and I was like, I knew I knew this address. It was the, uh, the local like family homeless shelter in our town. And so I was like, all right. So I'm looking at the name. I'm like, John Smith. Why does this name ring a bell now? Like, I'm just starting to connect the dots. Like, I know this name outside of just working this warrant. And so we go inside and I'm talking to the person that works at the front desk. And I was like, John Smith, when was he here? And they said, well, he was here about six weeks ago. Was he here with anybody? It's like, yeah, he was here with a female. And it just all like fell into place. And I was like, was he staying in room six? And they were like, yeah, how do you know? And I was like... Yeah, he was here with, with Joan Smith, no relation, you know, with this girl, this female. Yeah, he was here with this female. It's like, yeah, I know because I came to do a home visit on her because I have her on my caseload. <laughs> and a guy walked out the door as I was walking in and that was totally him. And so I was like, okay, so they're connected now. All right, so I've connected the dots a little bit more. 
So they obviously were staying at a homeless shelter together. I know where her new apartment is. So I, I talked to the team. I was like, we're going to go to this apartment. We're going to try to find, we're going to see if he's there. And they're like, okay, let's go. So we go, I start knocking, no answer. It's just, you know, you guys as POs know there's like knocking in nobody's home and then knocking and you just know somebody's in there. And so it was one of those. So we start knocking and we just knew somebody was in there. So the, uh, the blinds do one of those like psh, psh, where somebody looks through the blinds <laughs> and then closes them. And I was like, answer the door. Or I'm going to knock it in. Like, come on, this is just stupid. So this person answers the door and we're looking at her and my partner goes, you're Sally Jones. And she was like, yeah, it's like, you have a warrant. It was a completely different offender in this house that had a warrant. And so put her in handcuffs, go inside. My girl comes down the stairs and I was like, is John here? And she's like, John, I haven't seen John. I don't know where he's at, but she keeps looking up the stairs. And I was like, why do you keep looking upstairs? No reason. I was like, I was like, uh, I was like, why do you keep looking upstairs? And he was like, she was like, no, I don't know. I don't know. Get her downstairs. So this, this female offender I had, had a, a small daughter who I knew and I saw her and I was like, is John here? And she kept looking at the ceiling and I was like, is he in the ceiling? And she was like, <laughs> she just shook her head. Yes. And I was like, okay, thank you. So there was like a crawl space that was like two feet square in the ceiling of the, uh, of the closet. And I mean, he was up there trying to, trying to punch his way through to the apartment next door. And we eventually had to drag him out of the ceiling. He falls and destroys this room because he just sprawls out on the floor, you know, put him in handcuffs, take him out. We cleared three warrants that day from people that were in this apartment. You know, so that was, it's just people being stupid really aggravate me sometimes. So, so that was one, well, one time, uh, yeah, one time we were serving this warrant for, for a guy with the Fugitive Task Force, and he was known to be a violent offender, and we had to knock the door open, the door flies open, he's standing two feet inside the door, and there was like a guy with a shield, a guy with a rifle and then me. And so they're like, Matt, go hands on, Matt, go hands on. And so I grabbed him just instinctively. And he was, so just for the audience out there, I'm 6'1", 220 pounds. This guy was like 5'3", 97 pounds. And I just grabbed him and I just basically threw him and I went with him. And we went crashing through a baby gate and I just fell on top of him. And all I heard was as all of the life escaped him as I landed on top of him and rolled him over and handcuffed him. And then we're, we're walking out to the car and he stops like stips aboard stops when we got to the lawn. And he was like, you really expect me to walk across the wet lawn like this? And I was like, well, I really expect you to answer the door. So yeah, you're gonna walk across the lawn with no shoes on. You know, it's just ridiculous. They find the most ridiculous things to complain about, like in the heat of the moment where I have to stop and just think, oh my gosh, why, why is this conversation occurring right now? Wait, hold on, I, I, I got hold on, I got I got a similar situation like that. We were looking for a juvenile in a neighboring county. We uh, went to his mom's house. She swore up and down he was not there but we were able to convince her to let us search the house. Now, mind you, it took her about 10 minutes for her to come to the door. She kept, oh, hold on a second. I'm not dressed or, oh, I'm, oh I got to put the dogs up. She kept stalling. So we knew something was wrong. So she eventually let us in the house. We did. We, we swept the first floor. We swept the basement. And then we went up to the second floor. We swept the second floor. We didn't see them, but there was a uh, one of those attic access uh, hatches. And a rope was swinging. We're like, I was like, did you knock that rope? They're like, no. I was like, he's up there. <laughs> so we pull it down, and it's a duplex. 
And he's trying, just like your guy, was trying to bust a hole into the other duplex through into their attic crawl space. So, you know, we have guns drawn on him. We eventually get him to come down. All he has on is just his underwear, because I guess he must have been asleep in the middle of the day when we came looking for him. He had just his underwear on. So we started taking him to the car, and he's like, well, you're not going to put any clothes on? I was like, if we had came to the door and we didn't have to do all that with you, and you weren't trying to bust out walls, yes. Guess what? They have clothes for you when you get to the detention center. So we put him, put him back in the sheriff's car, and they drove him to the jail in just his underwear. <laughs> you ride how you hide. You ride exactly. how you hide. That's what we exactly. say. Yeah. Uh, let me see what I mean. I can't under beds, under mattresses. One time we were searching a house, and the a guy was holding the basement like at the top of the stairs in the kitchen, and he heard like a plink, and then a a uh, a bolt. He saw a bolt roll across the floor of the basement, and he was like, "Oh, the guy is definitely down there." You know, I think. I think that's an important lesson for people doing this is if you think something is out of place, it's out of place. You got to trust yourself. When you go into a house, you know what things should look like in a house. That's why it's important to do field work and to, to just get a, a sense of what houses look like and what their layouts are. You know, uh, a big thing is just like, just like we were talking about attic crawl spaces. A lot of times people will seal those for the winter They'll put the spray foam around it and stuff. So has the spray foam been disturbed? Are there pieces of insulation or something on the floor where they shouldn't be, where somebody maybe crawled into a ceiling or crawled underneath something? You just got to be on the lookout for stuff that doesn't that doesn't fit. And then you just got to go with your gut at that point. Okay, Matt. So how is your relationship working with local law enforcement when you do have to um, get these warrants taken care of? So our working relationship is really great with our sheriff's office. Our sheriff's office contributes two full-time deputies to the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force. And me and the guy that I work with uh, work very closely with them in developing information for warrants. And they're really good about if we feel like an address is good to, to hit that address. So, you know, I think that's, that's pivotal in the relationship that we have. We have a really good relationship with the U.S. Marshals. Uh, they work most of our drug and violent offenders. Uh, me and a guy I work with go out with them. So, you know, we, we, it's about developing relationships with people. Don't get me wrong. There are definitely departments that, that think probation officer and think, uh, and think, oh, okay, whatever you're saying, just give me your info and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do whatever with it. But Having at least one agency in your county, preferably the sheriff's office, I find that sheriff's office, that the sheriff's offices tend to be really great guys to work with. They usually have guys that only work warrants as opposed to some PDs, which just don't have the manpower to do that. Around here, there's a lot of PDs that just have their, their man hours are just real short right now. So they don't have people to donate to all of that stuff. So getting with the sheriff's office is usually pretty a pretty good route to take. Uh, but it's all about developing relationships and just getting to know people and having them know that that you're you're a dependable source of information. And I mean, I think just developing sources in general is a is a good idea. You know, just having confidential informants of people that are on probation where you can pass along information, stuff like that. That's really important for uh for, for this kind of work with working with absconders and people with open warrants, but uh, put yourself out there. You know, if somebody doesn't like you, somebody doesn't like you. That's, that's their problem. Don't worry about it. You may never have to speak to that person ever again, but if that's the one source that you can cultivate, that's going to be really good in a police department or in a sheriff's office, then go for it because information flows both ways and really good officers know that both probation officers and police officers or deputy sheriffs, because they know then they can come to you when they need info. Now, the caveat to that is police often don't, often don't understand that just because somebody's on probation doesn't mean that they forfeited every constitutional right that they have. A lot of police officers think that they can ask us to detain people or they can ask us to go do stuff that we still can't do. And it's about us being really good POs 
being able to tell them, no, 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 man, that's not within the scope of what I can do, but I can help you in other ways. Just, just let's work through it. Uh, I think there are a lot of POs that want to see themselves as being on the eight, nine, or 10 on the two hat scale that mm -hmm. think they have to prove themselves to a police officer. And we don't need to do that. It's mutual respect. We can build mutual respect. They'll appreciate what we do and how we go about doing it as long as we respect them for what they do and how they go about doing it. Because I'll be honest, there are times when I've been really frustrated with some local law enforcement where I want them to do something for me related to arresting somebody that maybe is on probation with me where I say they call me and they say we have John Smith pulled over on a traffic stop. John Smith has been a really bad dude today, by the way. As you can see, he's done everything wrong. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we got John Smith pulled over on a, a traffic stop. He's got a little bit of weed on him. Do you want to come pick him up? And I'll say something like, well, are you going to charge him with the weed? Well, if you're going to come pick him up, no. Well, what am I supposed to do? You just want me to come pick him up and take him to the jail for what? You haven't charged him with anything. Mm -hmm. You got to be, you have to be consistent and stand by, stand by what you believe in as the PO and not just say, all right, I'll grab my keys and I'll come, I'll come arrest John Smith just so that you can have a solid with the PD. You know, uh, what I found is that a lot of times they just don't understand our role because we do wear these two hats. And I mean, you know, depend on the agency because every agency is different where there are some agencies where the police really do think they're just social workers and this is all they're good for and that's it. But then, you know, when you have that healthy mix of 50 50, um, it's good. Like, you know, my carton department, you know, the cops can call us up and say, hey, listen, we think they're, you know, they're off this offender is selling drugs out the house or whatnot, or, you know, they're selling guns or they have guns. You know, we do have the power of warrantless searches. So that is definitely something where, you know, we could, you know, they, they might, you know, they might not always, you know, kind of look down on us, but when they want that search or things like that, that's when, that's when they want to come knocking. Um, but what I do find is that when I worked at juvenile office in PA, I worked very well with local police, very well. Um, they called on us for things. We called on them. It was a very mutual back and forth relationship, kind of like Matt was explaining. But here in my new department, because we're so large and we're in a large county um, and we're a large agency, you don't get to really build that one-on-one -on -one relationship that I had back, you know, back in juvenile because I was the PO for that area. So the, all those local cops knew me. But here, you know, I'm just one of, I don't know how many officers we have. I think we're like 50 or 60. You know, I'm just one. Um, so you definitely don't get to build that relationship. But we do get to do fun things like every now and then. We do operations with the sheriff's office where, you know, we'll all get together, go do some warrantless searches on high risk offenders, uh, go do some warrant searches. Um, so we do get to do those fun things where we get to go out with the sheriff's office, the PD, all the alphabet boys, FBI, ATF, DEA, U.S. Marshals. Um, we do get to do those fun things. Um, so, but, so kind of going along those lines, um, so you're, you're, you say you're on the fugitive task. Are you actually on the task force? Or you just kind of assist. No, I'm, I'm on the task force. I'm a, I'm a member of the, uh, the fugitive task force here in my local jurisdiction. Yeah. Uh, is that the, is that, is that the U S Marshals fugitive task force? Okay. Yeah. Is that a yes. Okay. Yeah. U S Marshals um, fugitive task force. Yep. Are you, dep are you deputized? I am. Yeah. Congrats, okay. man. I'm jealous. I gotta say I'm a little jealous. Definitely a little jealous of that. Um, I've never actually worked with the U.S. Marshals. I had them call me once on a juvenile case because they were looking for the juvenile's adult boyfriend. I think she was like 16 and he was 18. And they were looking for the boyfriend. That's the only time I've actually dealt with the U.S. Marshals. Um, but we actually, in, our, in my current department, we actually have officers that are called task force officers. And they're actually um, dished out to either the FBI, Safe Streets Task Force, or to the U.S. Marshals uh, Task Force, and they do nothing but absconders and those kind of cases. Um, but those are usually more like the high. So if we abscond somebody, um, you know, I might abscond somebody on a Friday, get into office on Monday, and I get an email saying this uh, this case this case has been adopted to the task force. You know, so they'll take them off my roster, and then um, a task force officer is working that case. And then once they arrest them, 
then they'll uh they'll put get the case back to me and now i gotta go handle the court stuff yeah that's I mean, it is what it is that's how the uh pro authority the state agency here handles it because my department is so small basically what uh what a officer will do in my department is they'll they'll just refer that case to me and let me know that that person has an active warrant and then uh, our sheriff's office works really well with me and the other guy that are on the task force. And we, we will work those warrants up and get them on the task force's radar then and, and go out and help serve them. I, the, the best part by far is the manpower that it brings and the, the team mentality that it brings that I know that the same, you know, 10 guys that I work with week in, week out on the task force are the same 10 guys that I work with every week to serve these warrants it builds a really good like team atmosphere to be able to trust each other to uh to go do some of this stuff you know most of ours are are violent and drug offenders and you just don't know what you're going to get into in those situations sometimes so it's really nice to have that that mentality so matt in your department what kind of equipment is issued for you guys to handle these warrants and searches so the uh the biggest thing that me and the uh, other guy that do warrants, we get rifle plates, which I would say anybody that's going to be working a high risk warrant should be wearing rifle plates, which for anybody that doesn't know, it's just a higher level of protection that protects basically your, your chest and, you know, your lungs and your heart and everything. I wear level four plates. They're a composite material. Basically they can take a, a round from an assault rifle and I'll still survive. I think that is, incredibly important uh that's the biggest thing our department supplies to us uh other stuff that i would say is imperative for anybody working warrants would be a weapon light and a flashlight two is one one is none so always have two of everything if you can uh but having a weapon light is incredibly important i i can't tell you how many times it's it's come in handy to have a flashlight on the end of my weapon so that I don't have to have both hands occupied. Uh, an earpiece for your radio, so that if you're in a house, people can't hear you and your team talking. Uh, two or more sets of handcuffs. I carry three sets myself. Uh, a tourniquet. First off, in any type of field work, you should have a tourniquet on your person at all times. I carry two tourniquets with me. And I carry a, a med pouch that has quick clot bandages. Uh, you know, I think. A, Hyphen chest seal. Yeah. Pipe, yeah. I got, you know, it's one of those. I got mine from Blue Force gear. It comes all vacuum sealed and stuff. It just goes straight in my pouch that I carry on my vest. Uh, I think being able to save a life, no matter whose life that is, is vitally important if you're going to be in these situations. Uh, and then, uh, it, me and the guy that I work with, we, in terms of weapons, uh, I carry a Glock 22 full size frame Glock. Uh, he carries a Glock 23, which is the same size as the Glock 19. It's just in 40 caliber. We both carry 40, 40 caliber with full size Glock magazines so that if anything would ever happen, I can't put his magazine that's in his gun right now into my gun because I have the full size Glock. So he carries full size Glock mags on his person. I carry them on my person so we can swap magazines if we have to. Uh, we both carry rifle magazines because we have a rifle that we can use if we have to. Uh, I am certified in Taser OC ASP, which I'm very thankful that my department does that for us because I know there are a lot of departments that OC is the only thing you get. And there are even some departments that don't do any less lethal. I think just having a less lethal option is vitally important just for subject control purposes. Uh, I carry uh, four pistol magazines on me when I work warrants. When I'm just doing field work, I only carry two, but it's all about having your equipment set up on your person in the most ergonomic way for you. So if you would look at my vest, and I, I can send these guys some pictures of, of the way I carry my stuff, uh, it is, it's for me. It's so that I can get to everything that I need to get to. So make sure when you train, you wear your stuff the same way that you would wear it if you were in the field, just doing regular field work too. 
you know, a big important thing for me is being able to get to my magazines with both hands and being able to get to my handcuffs with both hands. So I make sure that I carry those in places where I can get to them with both hands and your tourniquet, get, getting to it with both hands. So I used to wear a duty belt. I now wear a carrier and all my stuff is on the front of my carrier so that, so that I can get to it with both hands. I think that's really important. Uh, you know, it's about, it's about having the best stuff for you. It's not about having the best stuff. What fits you best, the way that you can carry it, the way that you need to carry it. Uh, and just remember that that's only one part. I, I wrote down a, a thing here. I'd say 80% of working warrants is developing the sources and finding the person and 10% is the, the kicking the door in quote unquote part of it, you know? So make sure you're prepared for that, but make sure you have the resources available to you to, to find the person because you can't do the other part if you can't do the first part. Uh, and then just real quick, I'll hit on training. Uh, make sure that you have defensive tactics and subject control at the very minimum. And then a combat first aid class like we take, we do those in my department every year, uh, defensive tactics, subject control and a combat first aid class. And then me and the guy that, work, that I work warrants with, we do some, some extra vehicle stuff and some extra room clearing stuff, but just being prepared so that you can call on those skills whenever you need, just like cognitive behavioral therapy stuff, how you need to do that every year to be able to call on that stuff when you need to. Everything works in harmony in probation. And that's something that, that's why we want to be at that five hats right we want to be in the middle so that we can do both sides if we need to couldn't say any better myself couldn't say any better myself but i definitely am jealous because there are very very few probation departments where they get to carry rifles so you're definitely lucky on that one um that's something that in pa we never we can never do it's something here um blind officers don't do but our task force officers they carry rifles and, and that's um, why we get it about is because of the we're on the task force. We're not allowed to do it in any other capacity except when we're with the task force. So, you know, I'm very thankful that our chief said that we could do that uh, with the understanding that it would only be for task force work. But uh, it's being as he understands that it's about being as safe as we possibly can at all times in whatever situation we're in. So exactly, exactly. And one final question: Are you guys required to respond to active shooter events? Uh, we are not required. But I, I would say that all of us would. Uh, a lot of us have an app. I can't even remember what it's called right now, where if there's an active shooter event, it pops up on your phone and tells you where it is so that you can go and help. I'll find out the name of it. But uh, I don't have it because I just listen to the radio all day because I have no life. So I just have right. the, <laughs> my radio on at my desk and listen to I it all day. You. So, yeah, I have so, my radio uh, on all day. So... Uh, so, yeah, and that would be another good thing, just as an FYI, is have a great relationship with your dispatch if you use radios. And if you don't use radios, talk with your department about getting on some sort of radio net, because having somebody know where you are at all times is, especially if you're working warrants, is the most important thing. It's more important than anything else, because if you need help, you need people to know where you're at. You know, like, Agreed. I know that there are a lot of departments, ours included, when we just do field work, where all you got to do is have an itinerary so that they know where to, like, send people if they need you if they need to find you but if you're working warrants you should be on a radio net of some sort for sure i hear you hey matt i think you dropped a lot of knowledge today on the two hats podcast you definitely shared a lot um i think a lot of our uh subscribers you know are looking to get into the field um will definitely definitely really uh benefit from this um i know i have you know, I'm going to say I'm a little jealous, too, but definitely uh, learning how everyone does things in different jurisdictions is definitely very interesting. And absconding and warrants are definitely a big part of probation because some of the fact is that they don't they're not going to uh, offenders are always are not always going to follow the rules. That's why they're on probation to begin with. So I couldn't said it better myself. Age, when they disappear, they have to be brought back into. They have to be brought back in so they can be held accountable for their actions, just like you were saying earlier. So, Matt, hey man, we appreciate you. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Matt. Well, thanks for having me on, guys. I, I really appreciate it. And just like you guys were saying, it, it's about us as a community coming together to learn from each other because 
we don't have shows like Cops or Live PD or anything that exposes the community to what we do. You know, I have this conversation with people I work with all the time that think, you know, Joe Concerned Citizen thinks probation is like the most hardcore thing, right? Like if you mess up probation, you go to prison and they just don't get how much we have to do as probation officers to keep offenders in compliance and to try to keep them out of prison. Really? That's really what we're trying to do. They, they were given the opportunity to not go to prison. So we got to make sure they don't go there. So hey. yeah, that's about, <laughs> about dropping hey. knowledge and sharing our, our thoughts for sure. That's what this is all about. I'm glad I could help out. Again, thank you, Matt, for joining in for today's podcast. That interview was amazing. As always, guys, please leave any comments that you have in the comment section below. We are answering everybody's questions. And follow us at Two Hats Podcast on Instagram. And we will see you here next Wednesday, 7 p.m., same time, same place. All right, guys. Till next time. Have a good one.